for just a minute, I want you to close your eyes. I'm not going to pull any pranks on you. I just want you to close your eyes and imagine that you're blind. Now, in your mind, imagine completing a few basic daily tasks. Imagine yourself separating your medications, getting them, getting your daily meds ready to take. How do you tell them apart? Especially the ones that are shaped about the same. Some you may be able to feel, but how do you know what you're taking? Imagine using the microwave to warm up some leftovers. How do you know you're using the right button on, on the microwave? Not cooking that pork chop for 15 minutes. Imagine you're trying to catch the bus to go somewhere downtown. How do you know it's the right bus? How do you know you're on the right side of the street even? How would you know if the food in the fridge is expired? You're just going to rely on the smell test? Think of all the uncertainty and all the questions you might have because you can't see. You can open your eyes. Well, there's a, an app out now. It's a nonprofit app <coughs> that allows people who can see to lend their eyes to those with visual impairments through video chat. Simply put, that's kind of creative and remarkable. It's, it's called Be My Eyes, and it's still on the App Store. You can pull out your phone and put it on your phone your, and put it on there today if you want and be the eyes for somebody in need. It was developed by a visually impaired man in Denmark, and it connects blind people to sighted volunteers. Anyone can download the app, offer to help. It's easy to find it. It's still, like I said, still in the App Store on your phone. And so the volunteer can answer questions because they can see the blind person's surroundings through that person's phone camera. Okay? So there was a day when uh, one Be My Eyes app user connected with a young man who wanted to know the expiration date of the milk in his refrigerator. The visually impaired man positioned his phone's camera to the top shelf, and then kind of the guy looking through his you know, video chat, looking through it, kind of directed him, okay, move it up, move it down, move it to the left, until he could see the expiration date. And looking at the image of the milk carton on his phone, the helper simply said, I wouldn't drink that if I were you. <laughs> As Jesus nears the end of his journey to Jerusalem, where he will be betrayed and he will endure a sham of a trial and be brutally beaten to within an inch of his life and then to within an inch of his life and then crucified on a Roman cross. As he nears the end of that journey, he encounters a blind man, a blind beggar on the road just outside of Jericho. Jerusalem and all that Jesus knows that awaits him there is just 18 miles away. At this point, his stress and anxiety are, are climbing. His sense of what's coming. But still, with all of that distraction, as he's moved with purpose toward Jerusalem, and he knows what's coming there, and all of that's on his mind, and all of that's weighing on his shoulders, he still sees this man and cares about his situation and offers hope and healing. Now, this is the last message in our journey together through Mark's gospel until we come back to it this fall. And it's a good place to make that break because we're going to leave Jesus at the gates of Jerusalem. The next passage is his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And so we'll walk through his final week in Jerusalem this fall. But we'll be taking a break to look at the life of David in the Old Testament this summer in a series we're calling Faithfulness and Failure. But for today... Let's continue through Mark. Turn with me to Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. And they came to Jericho. Everybody who knows the, the terrain knows that 
Okay, he's getting close. It'd be like someone today saying, and he got to Kingsley. Or coming up the interstate and they were in Kalkaska. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples in a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting at the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he's calling you. I, I find that interesting. Because the people who were telling this man to shut up and sit down are not like, He's calling you, come on! I mean, if you're going to follow the crowd all the time, you're going to be on a roller coaster. Because they just go where the momentum takes them. Jesus wants to see the guy, suddenly he's the greatest thing in the world. Before they were telling him to shut up and sit down and leave Jesus alone. That's life as a follower. Not a follower of Jesus, but a follower of the crowd. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. How he got there, I don't know. Because he couldn't see, but they, maybe they helped him. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, go on your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. It had been a long haul from Capernaum on the northeast shore of the Sea of Galilee, around the western side of that lake. And then they crossed over the Jordan River, which flows right down the center of Israel. You've got the Sea of Galilee in the north. You've got the Dead Sea in the south. The Jordan River flows from one to the other. They traveled along the eastern shore of the river to avoid Samaria. So they're going right down the Jordan, but they don't go right down the Jordan because Jerusalem is, is over. I'll, I'll, I'll use your perspective. Jerusalem's over here on the west. You know, the Mediterranean Sea's over here on the west. They're up here in the Sea of Galilee. And they go around the lake on the western side, and then they go all the way over here, crossing the river, which is always a dangerous thing to do, down the shore of the river, all the way almost to Jerusalem, to Jericho. And then they cross back over the river again. All of that just to avoid going through the territory of Samaria. Because they viewed that whole region as being unclean, full of spiritual deviance and half-breeds. In their mind, certainly not people God could ever love or even tolerate. Now Jesus, of course, spent a lot of time in Samaria. Because Jesus was always doing things that other people didn't think he should be doing. But this time, as he travels for the last time from Capernaum to Jerusalem, he takes the traditional route the route taken by Galilean pilgrims going to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover there. Around the Sea of Galilee to the west and then all the way back across the Jordan River to the eastern part of Israel, down along the river, crossing back over to the western side of Jericho, skipping Samaria and on to Jerusalem. Jericho, of course, is famous from the, from the Old Testament story, right? First city that the Israelites encountered when they went into the Promised Land. Famous for its uh, it's coll the collapse of its walls as the people of Israel marched around it. It sits just 18 miles northeast of Jerusalem, way down in the Jordan River Valley. And by down, I mean really down. At 846 feet below sea level, Jericho is one of the lowest positioned cities on earth. Sounds like a miserable place. I mean, usually when we think of being below the sea level, we think of like, like Death Valley. You know, really hot, sand, nothing there. Sounds like it's a miserable place, but it's actually one of the loveliest places in the entire Middle East. It's called the City of Palms. 
In first century, listen to how first century uh, Jewish historian Josephus described it. He said it's the most fruitful country in Judea. It bears a vast number of palm trees besides the balsam trees, which bear, which, who sprouts, the balsam tree sprouts, they cut with sharp stones, and at the incisions they gather the juice, which drops down like tears. He goes on to say, this country withal produces honey from bees. It bears the balsam, which is also the most precious of all the fruits in the place, cypress trees also. He who should pronounce this place divine would not be mistaken, wherein is such plenty of trees produced as are very rare and of the most excellent sort. It was like an oasis. It was a beautiful place. In fact, it kind of became an inland resort town, kind of like Traverse City, only we're not inland, we're on the water. But royals, including Herod, built enormous summer palaces there. And that's where they'd spend their summers. Complete, those palaces were complete with swimming pools, gardens, bathhouses, a hippodrome, and a theater even. Not a movie theater, they didn't have those yet, but you know, for actors to come in. So it was the ideal resting place for religious pilgrims before making the arduous climb up to Jerusalem. That's why the Bible always refers to people going up to Jerusalem. It was up vertically up in the mountains. We think of up as going north on a map because we're looking at a map. Up is usually north unless you're holding it wrong. But for them, they were going from almost 850 feet below sea level to almost 3,000 feet above sea level in just 18 miles. 18 miles of steep craggy serpentine road with a lot of switchbacks you ever been on you ever been in the hills of Tennessee or Kentucky you know the roads don't go straight up the hill do they they do this right you just do this until you're sick as you head up the mountain all right people's driveways do that right I mean you see driveways winding up it's like and we in from Michigan we're like man I wouldn't want to plow snow on that or drive down in the wintertime where they don't get the snow we do either. Um, so they had this steep, stony, rocky, craggy, serpentine road. It, and it, it, it was kind of an ideal place for bandits to hide and surprise and rob people. So it was kind of a dangerous road, even though all of the pilgrims from Galilee coming down out of the north part of Israel who stopped at Jericho before making that arduous climb up to, up to Jerusalem, right, they all um, took that trip, so there were, there were men, and then this time of the year, about a week, and maybe two weeks before Passover, there would have been thousands of them making that trip. But there were bandits on the road. But at this point on his journey, bandits and a steep, curvy road were the least of Jesus' worries. To Jesus, Jerusalem meant unimaginable physical and emotional and mental pain and anguish. It meant torture and death. And it was all staring him in the face. It was the last stop. He was at Jericho, the last stop before Jerusalem. And he's got all this on his mind and all of this weighing him down. But as he departs the oasis in the valley for the climb to Jerusalem, a, a blind beggar who had positioned himself along the road just outside of Jericho, hoping for charity from the thousands of Galilean pilgrims on their way to Jerusalem, he calls out to Jesus when he hears that Jesus who was, was coming by. He couldn't see it was Jesus. He was blind. But somehow he heard that it was Jesus walking by and the reputation of Jesus in this small part of the, the small country, the small part of the world, preceded him wherever he went. And so this guy finds out that it's Jesus and he calls out desperate for help. Actually, it was more of a shriek. The word Mark used to describe his calling out to Jesus isn't the word typically used to describe a beggar seeking charity where they'd call out alms for the poor, alms for the poor, and they would spread their cloak out in front of them and people would drop you know, a few, whatever, coins on that as they traveled by. Their change from McDonald's in Jericho, just got it back at the drive-thru. Drive-thru windows were higher because of the camels. 
Bad dad joke, I know, I know. It's Father's Day, what am I going to do? The word actually means to scream or shriek. More like what you would expect someone to yell out in a horror movie, right? That's what this word means. He isn't risking his call getting lost in the noise of the crowd. He wants Jesus' attention, and he's desperate. So there's no room for dignity or a calm demeanor here. He needs help. And the only one who can give it, the one he's, already, he's heard has already healed blind people just like him over and over and over again is walking by. He was blind. He couldn't get to where Jesus was for whatever reason. He didn't have friends who could take him to where Jesus was. And Jesus spent most of his time in a different region of the country. But now Jesus was here and he wasn't going to give away his shot. He's going to take it. Now in the eyes of the people though, this man is expendable. He means nothing. He doesn't matter. He's sitting by the roadside, totally dependent on others for guidance, for protection, and for charity. He couldn't see a bandit coming out. He wasn't that far outside the city walls, so they weren't going to attack there. But he couldn't see someone coming up to steal his money. He couldn't see to get there. He was dependent on other people for everything. He's totally helpless. When I was in college, a couple of friends of mine went hiking in the woods and hills of central Kentucky. Like, it was like the weekend before final exams in the spring one year. I think it was my junior year. And while they were out hiking, they found this huge vine hanging out of a tree. And they used it to swing out over one of the, you know, the ground in that part of Kentucky is like this. So there was like this deep ravine. It wasn't like a cliff, but it was a pretty steep hill down. It was all wooded. And then back up the other side. And they swinging out over it and swinging back. Well, one friend did. One friend swung out and, and came back. When my friend Steve got a hold of the vine, he jumped out over the ravine and it started slipping down. And basically what he did is he rode the vine down the steep side of the ravine and landed in a pile of the bottom with the, with, the, with the vine that had pulled out of the tree landing on top of him. And he broke, I think it was his right arm and his left leg. So when he got back to the dorm from his emergency room visit later that night, one arm and this arm, this leg are in a cast. Whatever it was, they were on opposite sides of his body. So he's got his leg in a cast, his arm in a cast. The man can't use crutches because he's got one arm in a cast. But he can't wheel a wheelchair because he's got one, you know, one arm in a cast. So if he spins it with one hand, he's just going to go in circles. So he would, we all took turns right? Getting him to class, getting him to meals, getting him to the library to study wherever he needed to go. You know, we'd all, hey, Steve, where do you, where do you need to go? And we were all pretty close. And at, at Asbury at that time, nobody was even permitted to live off campus, including people who lived in town. And Wilmore is a town about the size of Elk Rapids. Um, but even if you lived in town, you were required to live on campus to create campus community. Well, it worked because we were all close. We're close to this day. Um, and we all lived on the same hall for four years. Um, so we knew each other really well. And so we would just ask, hey, Steve, where do you need to go? And I was up to take him to class for one of his final exams. Unfortunately, in my own end of, sem uh, end of spring semester exam stress, I forgot. When I feel, finally realized I'd forgotten to take him to his exam, because we didn't have cell phones or anything then, I know, I'm old. Um, I went running down the hall to his room where he just sat, he was just sitting there in his wheelchair waiting on me to realize I'd forgotten him and show up and take him to his exam. He was just sitting there twiddling his thumbs. He had his, his blue book on his lap with his couple of pencils. He was ready. He was an English major, I think. And uh, so he was ready to just go, go take his exam. And he's just sitting there. About his exam started about three hours ago. And if you know Steve, if you'd ever met Steve, he wasn't mad. He's like one of the calmest people I've ever met in my life. I don't think I've ever seen him mad, ever. 
But he wasn't mad. But I rushed him out of the dorm over to the building where his exam was supposed to be happening, probably a little too quickly for his comfort. I mean, I'm like running with this wheelchair. I'm so sorry, Steve. I'm so sorry. And I'm, I'm apologizing the whole time. And then when we got to the classroom, I apologized profusely to the professor, who was the only one left in the room. Everyone else had completed their exam and left. Fortunately, the professor had mercy on Steve and his idiot friend and, um, and let him take the exam with no penalty. But for those couple of months, including after he went home, his parents had to, he couldn't drive himself home from school. His parents had to come get him. For that couple of months, he was completely dependent on others for everything. This man wasn't dependent on others for a couple of months. He was dependent on others for everything all the time. Sadly, when the people around him and around Jesus heard him shrieking, <clears throat> they told him to shut up. Jesus doesn't have time for you, you worthless piece of garbage. Be quiet. <coughs> Excuse me. He can't be bothered with you, blind man. Important things are going to be happening in Jerusalem. Sit down and shut up. But he kept calling out to Jesus. It was the only hope he had left, and he wasn't going to give that away. He kept shrieking more and more. Have you ever felt dirty or broken or worthless like that man did? We all have at some point. If I offered you a $100 bill this morning, would you take it? I don't have one to give you, but if I offered you one, <laughs> would you take it? What if I wadded it up and threw it on the ground? Would you still want it? What if I stepped on it and kicked it and even spit on it like horked up a big loogie? <laughs> Would you still want it? Maybe you'd want to wipe it off before you picked it up, but could you still go to the store and spend it? No. Yeah. Yes, you could. That bill has value because of what it is. Not because of how it looks or where it's been or what's, what it's been used for. A crisp, clean $100 bill is worth the same amount as, as an ugly, older, more used one, isn't it? They're worth the same amount. Maybe you feel like this man. Like you've been stepped on and beat up or kicked around. Maybe you feel dirty or unworthy or useless. But just like that $100 bill, no matter what you've been through, you still have value to God. This crowd sees the man in his need and they don't do anything to help. In fact, they keep him back. They want him to shut up. They want him to be quiet. They want him out of the way. And if there was ever a time in his life when Jesus maybe could have been excused for passing by without stopping, this might be it. But he didn't do that. He stopped. He said, call him. Call him to me. And like I said, the tune of the crowd changes. Take heart, get up, he's calling you. Suddenly they're excited. Maybe Jesus is going to do a miracle. But the, the attitude of the crowds have never been a big concern to Jesus. When they were there and they were calling out his name and there were 15,000 people on a hillside, or whether it was down to just a handful, he didn't care about the crowd. What he saw was not the size of the crowd, but the individuals who make it up. And the cares and concerns and needs that they carry. He sees you. He sees me. Now, I've been calling this guy the blind man up to this point, but he actually has a name. Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus. And that's significant. Because it's extremely unusual for Mark to name a person being healed. He never does it. He only does it one other time. Near the beginning of Jesus' ministry and near the end. All the others are just a blind man came. A, someone with leprosy came. This, that. But he never names them. He never even names the wealthy, young, rich man who came to Jesus. Saying, what do I have to do to have eternal life? 
The, and we, some other translations call him the rich young ruler. He was a man of authority. He was a man who people depended on and looked to. He was young, but he had resources. And resources buy you attention, and they buy you influence, and they make you seem important. That man didn't get a name. We only know him as the rich young man or the rich young ruler, depending on the translation of the Bible you're looking at. This nobody blind beggar that everybody wanted to keep back gets his name mentioned. In detail, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus. Maybe there were lots of Barts. Bartimaeuses. Or is it Bartimaei? I don't know. No, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus. Bartimaeus, Bartimaeus. His full Jewish name. Mark makes sure this specific man is identified without question. He has a name. He has a story. And God knows who he is. Nobody else does. Nobody else cares. The least likely one to be mentioned by name. One of the expendables is one of the only ones Mark actually named. And remember, Mark is telling Peter's story. That means Peter knew who Bartimaeus was after this day. This man who had been pushed aside and silenced and stepped over and stepped on for years is named, and he's named specifically Jesus sees you and he knows you. He knows where you live, whether it's a mansion or a tent. He knows what you drive, whether it's a Maserati or a Ford Pinto or whatever. But he doesn't just heal Bartimaeus and head on towards Jerusalem. He asks him a question. What do you want me to do for you? This phrase is verbatim the exact same question Jesus asked James and John when they came up to him and said, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask for you. Jesus' reply to them was exactly the same, word for word. What do you, Mark likes to repeat phrases. What do you want me to do for you? That's the immediately preceding passage. Mark is drawing a contrast between James and John and Bartimaeus. James and John said, we want you to do whatever we ask for you. They pushed themselves into Jesus' attention, just like Bartimaeus did. And they said, we want you to do whatever we ask. He said, what do you want me to do for you? Now, they represented two of the three who were the closest to Jesus, Peter, James, and John, his inner circle. They had been there on the Mount of Transfiguration when they saw Jesus in his glory. And apparently when they saw him there, <laughs> they started to get delusions of grandeur. Man, nobody's going to be able to stop us when this uprising starts. I mean, did you see him glowing in the dark? Heck, he was glowing in the daylight. Did you see that? He's just going to like speak and the Roman armies are going to be swept away. This, we're, we're talking like, like Red Sea leaving, e, our ancestors leaving Egypt levels of destruction here. That's what James and John are thinking. And what did they say? Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. We want to be the two most important people in your kingdom after you. We want power and glory and influence. What is Bartimaeus' answer to the same exact question? I just want to see. There's a strong comparison Mark is drawing here between the answer of James and John and the answer of Bartimaeus. They want to be made powerful. He wants to be made whole. Now this is the end of an entire segment, this journey to Jerusalem in Mark's gospel. And it's bookended by two episodes of Jesus healing someone who was blind. And in between that is a lot of material involving the disciples showing just how blind they were. Adventures in missing the point. 
the point of what Jesus was saying and doing over and over again. Truth is, we're all blind. Sin blinds us to the beauty of the kingdom of God and life in his kingdom. It blinds us to what God is doing around us and what God wants to do in us. It blinds us to the deep, deep love and grace and mercy of God. We all need to be healed, not necessarily of physically blindness, but of our spiritual blindness. And in this journey narrative inside within Mark's gospel, it begins and ends with Jesus healing someone who's blind, and in between we see nothing but the blindness of his disciples and how they didn't get it. I mean, Jesus has been telling his disciples plainly what's coming in Jerusalem. I mean, just a few verses prior, he says, See, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they'll condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles, and they'll mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. Jesus knows exactly what's coming. And after three days, he will rise. Could Jesus have been any clearer? I mean, he was like drawing diagrams for them. And what do they follow that statement by Jesus up with? We want to be the most important people in your coming kingdom. Talk about a face palm moment. I mean, they are blind. Truth is, we are all blind. That's part of the healing that Jesus does in us when we place our trust in Him and begin to follow Him. He heals us, not necessarily of physical blindness, but of spiritual blindness. And we need to understand something. That spiritually speaking, we are just as helpless and dependent as Bartimaeus. We're just like him. He's the one in the story we're supposed to identify with. We're supposed to see in ourselves. I'm just like him. Spiritually speaking, before God, I'm just like him. I'm not somebody. The one who came to Jesus thinking he was somebody left with nothing. The rich young man. Because he couldn't give it up. It's not at all surprising that just before riding triumphantly into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, Jesus' last act is to heal a blind man. The great Old Testament prophet Isaiah wrote these words in the voice of the coming Messiah. And I will lead the blind in a way they do not know. In paths that they have not known, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. These are the things I do, and I do not forsake them. What words do we sing in the great hymn? I once was blind, but now I see. Do you see? Or are you still blind? Or are most of us kind of like Peter and Andrew and James and John and Thomas and all the others? Jesus is starting to work in us, but we still don't get it a lot of the time. When Jesus heals of us of our blindness, we are set free to follow him. Look at verse 52. And Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Not, and he went home, but immediately he followed him. Jesus heals this man. What does he do? He follows him. The verb tense there is for all of the grammar nerds out there. An ingressive imperfect. It's the verb tense that indicates that something has started and never stopped. He didn't just follow him to Jerusalem. He started following Jesus that day. And when Mark's gospel was written to the Roman Christians facing persecution in Rome under Nero. That's who it was written to. Bartimaeus was still following Jesus. This man followed him and he never stopped. You know, there's another very likely reason that Bartimaeus is named here. 
Like I said, Mark is writing his gospel to the persecuted Christians in Rome a little over 30 years after the resurrection of Jesus. It was mid-60s A.D. He's writing to the church in Rome. And it's likely that this beaten down, bedraggled, these beaten down, bedraggled followers of, of Jesus knew Bartimaeus because he was part of the body of Christ. Hey, Bart, son of Tim, that's you Mark's talking about, isn't it? When Pierre Paul Thomas was growing up in Montreal, Canada in the 1940s, he couldn't do what most, most boys did and all of his brothers did, which was play hockey because he was born blind long before there was a cure for his form of blindness that was available. So for most of his life, he could only imagine the world that people often described to him. But how do you describe the color green to somebody who's, you know, I, you, you can only do so much. I mean, describe green, describe black, describe pink. You can't. And color is everywhere. It's what we use to describe things. What car is your car? The blue one. What house is your house? The, the yellow one with the red door. Right? Am I wearing a blue suit or a black suit to the wedding today? Everything we do involves color. Can I go or stop? Depends. Is it red or green? <clears throat> or stomp it? Is it yellow? That's what yellow means, right? Stomp it? Yeah. So for years he walked with a white cane, one of those white sticks, to avoid the obstacles in front of him. But the, at the age of 66, he fell down the stairs in an apartment building. Apparently the elevator was out. And he fractured the bones of his face. And he was rushed to the hospital with severe swelling around his eyes. And a team of doctors went to work to repair the bones, and they did. Months later, he went to be examined by a plastic surgeon for a consultation about repairing his scalp. And the surgeon casually asked him, oh, while we're at it, do you want us to fix your eyes too? He didn't understand. He didn't know how to respond. But there had been a medical intervention for his type of blindness for decades. And he didn't know it. And the doctor's like, by the way, we're going to have you open anyway. Want us to fix this? And he agreed. He had the surgery and he could truly see for the first time. And suddenly his world consisted of bright colors he could never fathom before. He spoke of being awestruck by flowers blossoming, trees blooming. As beautiful as that story is of a 66-year-old man who was able to see for the first time, there's a sad reality. He could have had the same surgery a long time ago and been able to see all this time. I want you to understand something. When Jesus takes the blinders off and we can see, it's like we're seeing for the first time. And we see, when we see this world through His eyes, we see beauty in places where others see ashes. In fact, the Old Testament prophet Isaiah said, I'll take your ashes and give you beauty for those ashes. But we see beauty where others see trash. We see value where others see people of no value at all. And we see color like never before. When we see this world through the eyes of our Creator, But the truth is, he could have been seeing that way all along. But he'd resigned himself to a life of blindness. In reality, he could have experienced the gift of sight decades later. Don't wait. All you got to do is say to Jesus, I want to see. I want to see the way you want me to see. Take my blinders off. And heal me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. 
and seeing I am set free to follow Jesus. His mercy is there for the asking. Let's pray. Loving God, we want to see most of us, I think all of us in this room, can see physically. But Lord, we want to see spiritually. Before you were blind, just like Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus. But we want to see. We want to see you. We want to see the beauty where you see beauty. We want to see hurt where you see hurt. We want to see value where you see value. We want to love the way you want us to love, knowing that we are loved by you. We thank you for seeing us this morning. Lord, if there's anyone in this room who needs to have the blinders taken off, I want to give them just this moment to do that. If you want to see, I want, you to, I want to invite you to pray this simple prayer with me. Say, Jesus, I'm going to ask the same thing of you that Bartimaeus asked. I'm going to ask that you open my eyes so that I can see. Come into my life. Forgive me, heal me, restore me. Because I want to follow you. And I'm not going to stop following you. Thank you for seeing me. Thank you for opening my eyes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.